deeply the followers of Sukarno, the phantom of national spirit, however, over everyone concerned with Indonesian future since the beginning of the revolution. The vision of Indonesian Asian traditional arts distinctly in the indefeasible in content and form as Indonesian were haunting. Why could not a modern art be evolved that would also distinctly Indonesian? Um, let us take a step back to understand what Lekra was because it's really important to, to know this and the um, connection with Sugiyati. Lekra was found in August 1950. By then, Sukarno, the first president of Indonesia, had mandated that every political party had to have an art institution. The political parties then used art and literature as an instrument to attract the mass. They had fully realized that, realized that books are a tool for propaganda and party recruitment. Through literature, they spread the ideas and theory theories that support the spirit of the party. Partai Komunis Indonesia, abbreviated as PKI or Communist Partai of Indonesia, gave Alekra the widest possible space to produce works and publish them in the PKI's newspaper, Harian Rakyat. Dipa Nusantara Aidit or DN Aidit, he is General Secretary of the Communist Party of Indonesia. In his book about literature and art, he wrote, the political work is the brain of the party, while literature and art are the heart of the party. Communists are human beings who have the best brains and hearts. Therefore, the communists did, did not draw a dividing line between political work and cultural work. Both are of the revolutionary worm now and in the future. This idea was the starting point of, for art to be so important for the Indonesian revolution after its independence. Lekra gave active support to everything that was new and progressive. Lekra actively assists and demolition of the reminders of colonial culture, which had left a part of the people in the in dark ignorance, with feelings of inferiority and with weakness of character. Lekra accepted the ancestor heritage culturally, critically, and studied carefully all its aspects. Just as it did the classical crea creation of other peoples anywhere, and those creatively in the fort to further to further and great tradition of Indonesian history and nation, directing it toward a new culture which is rational and scientific. Lekra proposed to its member, but also to other artists, scholar, and cultural workers who were outside Lekra, that they study the actual truth in life and be faithful to truth and reality. In the arts, Lekra support creative initiative, creative daring, and Lekra agreed with every form, every style, etc. So long as it was faithful to truth and meet the highest standard of artistic beauty. In short, in repudiating the anti-human, anti-social character of the culture that is not of the people, in repudiating the violence of truth and beauty. Legra helped save a new society capable of self-advancement, a society developing its individuality, individuality, which is both multifaceted and harmonious. Ultimately, Many artists wanted to join Lekra because of their alignment with the issue of common people, workers, and farmer. In addition, 
Lekra, which carried progressive ideas, also provides space for women to participate actively, including, including become, becoming member of the central board. In our research on this period, we found the name Sugerti Siswari, one of the three women on the Lekra Central Board whose name was the most significant. <clears throat> Although we were able to find his, her works, Sugerti's personal figure is too vague to trace. There was not a single biographical data attached to her works. What we see here is actually the only known picture of her, taken in 1963 during, during Asia African Author Executive Committee Conference. She is the one highlighted in the background. From various sources, like the Indonesian thesis by Fairuzul Mumtaz, an interview in a chapter by Nima De Punamasari in the book Yang Terlupakan dan Dilupakan, we found out that she was <clears throat> born and raised in Solo, Central Java. She was close to Gesang, the famous Keroncong singer who wrote the song Pengawan Solo. She was described to have a slender and tall figure. She moved from Solo to Yogyakarta and eventually to Jakarta, where she lived with her husband and her two children. Wherever she went, she always modestly wore a kebaya, a, tra a traditional Southeast Asian upper garment. And she was an energetic person and was known to be a fierce debater. Sugiyarti Siswadi was a member of Lekra in Yogyakarta branch. In 1959, she gave a speech in the first Lekra Congress in Solo. And during this Congress, she was also elected as a member of the central leadership of Lekra and moved to Jakarta. Eventually, she was appointed as the head of the committee for the first anniversary, anniversary of the Revolutionary Arts and Literature Conference. She was a top and the most productive writer within Lekra. She oversaw the publication of Api Kartini, uh, a PKI owned woman magazine. As a, short, uh, uh, as a short story writer, her works often fill the mass media, especially PKI's own newspaper, Harian Rakyat, or People's Daily. While in Api Kartini, she mostly wrote as a journalist. She occasionally used her pen name, Damaira, or an acronym, SS. Apart from writing personal books, Sugerti had also translated a number of short stories by writers from Bulgaria and other communist countries for Api Kartini magazine. Her own works were, were also translated and published in other countries like Vietnam, Korea, and the Netherlands. In addition to actively writing and running Lekra programs, Sugerti also taught in al Academy of Social Sciences in Jakarta. Uh, throughout her career as a writer, <clears throat> uh, she has only ever published one book, uh, Surga di Bumi, published in 1960 by Lekra. The book contains six short stories, most of which told about the fate, suffering, and circle of the underprivileged people. So here are some of the uh, her works that we can find. This is the cover of her book the only book. And this is uh, her poem published in a Dutch magazine. Hmm? Yeah. Uh, by early 1960s, there were three main power holders in Indonesia. On one hand is the military. On the other uh, side of the spectrum is PKI. With its, uh, with its 3 million members across Indonesia. And uh, the last one is Sukarno with his guided democracy. He held a supreme presidential authority. All political pairs had to circle around him. In a way, he acted as the figure that stabilized, stabilized this power dynamic. But by then his health started to deteriorate. deteriorate. Oof. And, ma and many doubted that he could keep the stability any longer. The great uncertainty at the time was, with, uh, was whether the party and the army would wait until Sukarno faltered before attempting to secure power, or whether either would seek an early advantage by launching a coup. 
This is the hard part. Although there has been a lot of research on 65 in Indonesia, especially after the fall of Suharto in uh, 98, there are still many things that are confusing and have not been revealed. In the early hours of October the 1st, 1965, six Indonesian army journals were assassinated. Those were shown in gray, allegedly uh, uh, were murdered. Allegedly, this was a coup attempt by the self-proclaimed 1st of October movement. Evidence to linking the PKI to journalist assassination is inconclusive. There are many theories about what actually happened. The army leadership made accusation of PKI's involvement at an early stage. Later, the government of President Suharto would reinforce this impression by referring them to the movement using the abbreviation uh, G30S PKI or Gerakan 30 September PKI or 30 September movement of PKI. School textbooks followed this, the official government line that the PKI worried about Sukarno's health and concerned about their position, should he die, acted to seize power and establish a communist state. Some speculated that PKI's involvement was, was very limited or that Suharto organ, organized the events in whole or in part and scapegoated the communists. A number of Western scholars, while rejecting Suharto's propaganda, argue that the 30 September movement was indeed a PKI coup d'etat. Yeah. But what definitely conclusive was the army quickly blamed the alleged cop attempt to on the PKI and began an Indonesian-wide anti-communist propaganda campaign. On October 2nd, the Halim base was recaptured by the army, although Harian Rakyat carried an article in support of the G30S or G30S COP, the official PKI line, and at the time was that the attempted COP was an internal affair within the armed forces. On October 6th, Sukarno cabinet held its first meeting since 30, sep September 30. The PKI minister, Nyoto, was in attendance. A resolution denouncing G30S was, based, was passed, and Nyoto was arrested immediately after the meeting. A mass demonstration was held in Jakarta two days later, demanding a ban on the PKI, and the party's main office was burned down. On October 13, Ansor Youth Movement, the young wing, the youth wing of Nahdatul Ulama, held anti-PKI rallies across Yafa. Five days later, Ansor killed about a hundred PKI members. After the failed September 30 movement, Cope popularly believed that to have been promoted by the Communist Party and the mass killings that followed. Sukarno replacement Suharto and his new order government Ben Lekra together with the other communist associated organization. In the ensuing violent anti-communist purge, an estimate 500,000 communists were killed and the PKI effectively eliminated. General Sukarno outmaneuvered Sukarno General Suharto outmaneuvered Sukarno politically and was appointed president in 1968, consolidating his influence on the military and government. During Suharto reign in the 18th, on September 30, all Indonesians were simultaneously told to watch the film, The Betrayal of G30 SPKI or Pengkhianatan G30 SPKI. This film depicts the alleged quarrelly of the PKI for kidnapping and murder of six generals who were then put into a place called Lubang Buaya or a crocodile pit 
after the the fall of Suharto in 1998, it was the only then that various researchers and discussion were dared to be carried out and published as widely as possible that it was a propaganda film. And apparently, another thing that was also revealed was the people who were eliminated at that time who were missed myths from the history of Indonesian and any history textbook. To quote Michael Borden in Cultures at War, the Cold War and Cultural Expression in South Asia, the new order regime of President Suharto, which laid its foundation, funda, foundation in part on the destruction of the PKI and slaughter or imprisonment of hundreds of thousands of its members and sympathizers justified its action and continued at times to bolster its legitimacy and its use to caution against dissident with a fierce anti-communist ideology. The ideology remained difficult to question until Suharto fall from power in 1998. This too was a legacy of the Cold War, which persisted long after the Cold War itself had ended in Asia. It should therefore come as no surprise that in the aftermath of the 1965 to 1966, events in Indonesia, most left-wing cultural and artistic activity was strictly prohibited. Writers, artists, and actors associated with left-wing organizations such as Lekra, Sarb, Bufis, and LKN, who fought in their respective media for a more socially committed culture that could further Indonesian nationalists and help create more equal economic and social condition, were either killed, imprisoned, or stranded in exile with no legal passport. One of the living witnesses of this incident is Joko Peke. Uh, he is an artist, lives in, Indo in Yogyakarta, Indonesia, and his famous painting is Berburu uh, Celeng or Hunting Boars, which depicts the condition of Indonesian leader during the New Order era. He talked to Dewa Bujana, an Indonesian guitarist, about his experience during the communist purge in an interview. So let's watch this short video to listen from the man, the man himself. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Oh, okay. Uh, Karena lekra, karena lekra, oke. Mata ditutup, suruh lari-lari, lari-lari masuk, langsung masuk lubang. Masuk jurang. Jurang itu, jurang itu ada airnya, langsung ke, ke laut. Ke laut, push. Ya, ke laut. Itu tahun 66, Presiden hmm. Bung Karno masih jadi presiden. Masa perang Jogja di bagian sana diperintahkan semua seniman-seniman ku yang ada di Jogja jangan ada yang dibunuh kalau ditahan pun jangan dibuat Jogja hmm. perintahnya bukan Oh gitu alasan alasan bukan begitu karena uh, Membentuk satu seniman itu lebih mudah membentuk seratus insinyur yang kan satu seniman. 
kata Bung Karno. Bung Karno bilang gitu. Saya hidup saya nggak ditahan 7 tahun. Lepas tahan di blacklist sampai 30 tahun umur hidup saya. Dipotong di blacklist saya nggak boleh ada kegiatan. Ini salah masa apa? Saya teman kita ditahan nanti kalau disakiti. Uh, let's wait for our online friends. Can finish it. Please just take a second. Okay. Uh, what happened to Joko Peke, the man in the video, also happened to countless others. Many were not as lucky as he was to live and tell the story. But how about Sugiarti? Unfortunately, she was one of the ones who were simply lost. The only information about her fate was found in the book Yang Terlupakan dan Dilupakan. In a chapter by Nima De Punamasari, that said that Sugiarti Siswari was prison in Bukit Duri, Jakarta, and event eventually she was moved to Plantungan concentration camp in Central Java, and she passed away in Yogyakarta in 1983. For years, her works were erased, her book was officially banned, and for a time. Her name was forever gone. What's left were her words that scattered across the country, through which people rediscovered her name again. Uh, and now let us hear some of her words come to life by having Umi uh, reading her uh, two of her poems for us. Uh, we're going to read it in its original Bahasa Indonesia, Indonesia first, and then we can like take turn to read the translation. I have like a paper here and like. Each person can like write one block of the poetry. Uh, the first poetry is Swanita or woman in English. Wanita, kami bukan lagi bunga pajangan yang layu dalam jambangan. Cantik dalam menurut, indah dalam menyerah, molek tidak menentang. Ke neraka mesti ngikut, ke surga hanya menumpang kami bukan juga bunga tercampak dalam hidup terinjak-injak penjual keringat murah buruh separuh harga tiada perlindungan tiada persamaan syarat dimuati beban Kami telah berseru dari balik dinding pingitan, dari dendam pemaduan, dari perdagangan di lorong dalam, di lorong malam, dari kesumat kawin paksaan. Kami manusia. Now let's uh, read the English version. Uh, maybe each can like write, uh, read one blog and pass it to the next person. Um, yeah, I mean we can uh, use the paper or write or, or read what's on the screen. <laughs> Who's going to start first? <laughs> okay. I don't think it's enough. I think it's enough. It's okay. Okay. <laughs> 
transfer of wealth in this world. Can you please do the way? Do the way to the way to the way. <laughs> we are not either scattered flowers in life we are planted. Sweet fruit sellers type five flavors without protection, without equality, have you <clears throat> we are shouting from behind the wall of seclusion, from the blending garage, from the trade in the halls of the night, from a forced marriage. We are humans. Don't want to talk about it. <laughs> 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 um, yeah, maybe we can move to okay. <laughs> right. <laughs> or I don't know. Yeah. Uh, the next one is kebebasan or freedom. Oh yeah. Uh, the next one is kebebasan or uh freedom. Hi hi. What? <laughs> kebebasan. Kebebasan telah mengubah wajah dunia. Dirajainya otak, hati, dan kepribadian. Disingkapnya kabut di gunung, di lembah, di pantai, di ladang, di pabrik, di kota, kota, dan di hati kami, wanita. Kini kami bukan lagi. Hanya melahirkan prajurit pekerja. Kami adalah prajurit pekerja. Bukan lagi hanya istri pahlawan rakyat. Kami adalah pahlawan rakyat. Dan jika nanti benteng zaman tua sudah hancur, perkasa berdiri kubu pekerja di persada tanah, Airku, kami bukan lagi hanya penabur bunga, membaca doa dan meratapi kehilangan. Kami adalah sebagian anggota pasukan yang terdepan. We are no longer just the wives of people's heroes. We are the heroes of the people. And we place them in the old fortress is destroyed. Might we stand the stronghold of workers in my homeland? We are no longer just flowers or to read the prayers and know the losses. We are some of the frontline men. Thank you, Kay. <laughs> um, it is uh, difficult to uh, find some context or even a year uh, when the the, po the poems were written. Uh, that's how difficult it was. Um, but yeah, uh, uh, we would like to thank everyone for reading the, the, the poem with us. And after this, we want to open the, the floor for discussion. Um, yeah, because I don't have any more else to say. <laughs> yeah. um, oh, 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 yeah. <laughs> oh, Balisa. <laughs> <laughs>
Thank you for the first opportunity to say something. And thank you so much for, first of all, choosing to read her work. I think, um, I mean, I, I have to say I was so fascinated seeing her name popping out in the first uh, AFSAR kickoff meeting because uh, like, I mean, like you said, her name is uh, so unknown, even by people who research like writings from the leftist uh, uh, writers in Indonesia. Um, of course, she was not the only female writers from, from the group, but maybe she is the most obscure. Uh, while it seems that she um, has been a major organizer in, in the Communist Party uh, Artist Association, LECRA, that Umi has um, introduced. So uh, I cannot say enough that I was super excited to see her name popped up in that screen in this very room <laughs> that we are today. So thank you. Thank you very much uh, for choosing to, you know, read her together today. Um, I, I am not uh, a literary expert. I am actually working with old films, so I, I work with um, restoring films, archiving films. Maybe what I can offer today is very simple. It, um, it is in no way like philosophical or, you know, it's not a historical research, um, but I would like to share my experience with supporting other people who read her works. So here uh, with me, I have a book, a book that was quoted also uh, by Umi and Azari. Um, it's called in Indonesian, Yang Terlupakan dan Dilupakan. So a literal English translation would be um, the forgotten, uh, okay, the unintentionally forgotten and the one who's forgotten, like in brackets, intentionally. Um, and this book is about 10 female writers. The uh, only common thing between them, uh, except um, be, uh, uh, besides being female, is that they're all dead. So uh, I, I, I began to know this project in 2018, uh, where a group of um, writers, book editors got together uh, and created an open call um, for young writers of today, young female writers of today who want to kind of research about dead women writers. I mean, they call it something like, um, uh, like revisiting or even um, un uncovering the graves of, uh, you know, our literary mothers. So it's uh, a, a bit gothical, I, <laughs> I suppose. Um, but the, um, uh, so the, the forum happens in the stretch of seven or eight months between 2018 and 2019, where each week uh, they would share their research process. And one of them was about Sugiyarti Siswadi. Um, I have to say, it, it was not the first time that I heard her name, but like you said, even a, a photograph of her was so hard to find. But yet uh, it seems that from this research process and from this other, um, uh, is it thesis? Yeah, thesis, right? Uh, uh, we found out how active she was in, in organizing uh, the Writers Association, and she has done uh, a lot of transnational work, transnational organiz organizing work, uh, especially with Asian African uh, writers. And what is interesting for me um, in this uh, book is that um, all researchers try to balance between biography research and close reading. Um, and perhaps I can offer some quotes from, uh, because we have talked more about her biography, maybe I can offer some quotes from the close reading part in this book. Uh, the first one, um, very interestingly, was from the poem we just read together, the first one. Um, and 
I think it is also very interesting to note that um, the title itself apparently is not stable, right? Um, so here, uh, I mean, uh, we we have read it, and the title was Juanita, tr uh, literally translated um, a wo woman. Uh, well, here uh, in in the research of uh, Nilo Purnamasari, uh, the title is called Bunga Dalam Jambangan. So. Uh, literally flowers in a vase. Um, it often happens, uh, especially, you know, after maybe between the year of 40s uh, up until 1960s, when we started having like literary critics who published their work. So before that, a lot of poets, short story writers would just arbitrarily change <laughs> the title of their work. Sometimes their work would be published without title. Yeah, so uh, I I'm not again like I'm not an expert, but I I can say that this is actually quite common to have the same work called differently in different publication. And um, um, what is interesting about that poetry, I think, uh, is because it was published in. Um, um newspaper or periodical from uh, the leftist artist association already in march 1959 so in the same year that this association was founded um i think it is uh, very important to say that since the very beginning um there is this attempt to be polyphonic like not uh, it doesn't generalize um the same experience between uh, male writers and female writers, and rather they gave room actually to uh, female subjectivity by publishing this uh, this poem. So um, this is uh, one of the first points that uh, was put forward by uh, Ni Madipurna Masari in this article. The second one that I would like to bring up um, is um, coming from the reading from her short stories. So Sugi Artisiswadi, apart from writing poetry, she also wrote um, articles like journalistic articles and short stories. Um, one of um, the close reading result here is on a short story called Para Siang, which probably literally translated is um, dusk so the period between the day and and night um and this is um an account of um a man who has left his family um and disappeared for a while for some years coming back to the family only to find that uh his former wife was dead and he only met with the sister of the wife and um the the tension in that is being discussed in this article that i find interesting is that the sister of course um is showing re repulsion to to the man um but then there is a, a like a third voice the narrator's voice um that observes the change of psychology in the sister um, after she voiced her anger uh, and then she slowly turns into um, a more forgiving uh, person uh, and started reading the behavior of this man in terms of um, what was systematically happening at that time, war, poverty, uh, and of course, class struggle. And uh, so uh, Nima de Purnamasari was uh, making a special note about this because apparently this is a special feature that rarely is found uh, in other writers of, of her time, this ability to expose like a more structural problem uh, in, in the society through literary work. The last point that I would like to offer uh, from this book is um, 
Yes, Sugiarte Siswadi's work, well, uh, I mean, uh, she only published one book. Uh, and for some literary critics, including uh, critics from her own peer, um, she sometimes is considered as somebody too simple. Lacks, she lacks sophistication because she writes uh, uh, in, in a very strictly descriptive manner. She has um, uh, consistently used or evoked this, this style um, and she loves details. Uh, and sometimes this kind of bores the critic. And, uh, but what um, Nima de Purnamasari found interesting here, um, is actually what those details and the length of these details do to the reader. Um, and here, um, to finish, I, I want to quote that she said these details, um, and also sometimes its subtlety, um, evoke a certain depth, um, and look into the characters of poor people, Wong Chilik, <laughs> common people, <laughs> uh, but most of them, uh, most of the time they're also poor, so like common and poor people. <laughs> um, that That is very touching. And um, especially with subjects and um, description of, of the world, close to the characters which we can say seem to be the reflection of who ourselves are. So she kind of say uh, that her detailed description and this lengthy occupation with detail from the reality of her character that are mostly like common and poor people is actually a reflection of, of her readers. So with that, um, I mean, with the three points I um, I offer to you know expand um, uh, our let's say it opportunity of getting introduced to Sugiarti Siswadi. Thank you very much. Um. Yeah, let's talk. <laughs> um, you see, you what we do. I think I think we should just like start to talk and throw each other's question. How are you doing? He's. Right. Yeah. Thank you very much for this interesting and inspiring presentation. Um. Uh, my question is actually on a detail that attracts my attention, attention during the presentation here. Uh, you were mentioning um, um, a newspaper from Netherlands or a Dutch newspaper mm -hmm. uh, where the uh, poem by um, Sugarti Siswadi was published. And uh, was this um, a newspaper which was published in Netherlands or was it a Dutch newspaper which was published in Indonesia? Do you know? Some details on that. Good question. Mm -hmm. I missed that. <laughs> I missed that. It could be interesting. Yeah. So um, actually, I found it in in our website called Delver. Delver is an archive for Netherlands, like you know, like manuscript, old manuscript, and I found many, many Indonesian information, history in this website, and you can like download it um, for free. And I found that, and that is a Dutch newspaper which published in seven, August 17, 1955. So, yeah, that's how I can found this. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Huh? And also the interest, uh, interesting part is like, this is in Dutch, fridge height is in, in, in Bahasa Indonesia means, literally means kebebasan. So also like what we 
read now, but the the content, the the what's the isinya tuh the content the content it's different with what we read now. So maybe <laughs> yeah, I don't know maybe. So I guess that's emphasize again the point of uh, what what Lisa Bona already said. Like there are many arbitrariness on how they present their work. Sometimes they post like poetry with the same title. Sometimes they change the title altogether. Oh. I'll try. Yeah, just the title part for I'm Oh, how to scroll. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's from uh, the natural language of the Netherlands. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can do this. Wait. Uh, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah, and it seems to say it's called Dachla, so it's like the newspaper of the people. I don't know which people, but people, yeah. 17th of August, yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. Sorry. This is in itself probably interesting. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this date is not really recognized in the Netherlands. No. But they do they do have like this news, like 10 years Indonesian Republic. Yeah. Uh, so by then they yeah. still haven't <laughs> 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 Yeah, You have a question? Oh, yes. Uh, okay. Um, first of all, thank you. You spoke the poems very beautifully. It's very nice. Um, and I have a question about so. Sujerji Saswadi was in Lakra and she was one of three women in Lakra. Did they have a like a specific prescription for women's role in Lakra and what they were supposed to write or about um, how their role was in Lakra was in any way important for feminism or for communism? Um, from what I understand, her their lore, uh, sorry, their role in Lekra, uh, uh, especially is not specific to, uh, the woman activism, uh, but it's their role outside Lekra itself. Uh, for example, like in Api Kartini, uh, also PKI owns magazine where they like actively write about the topic, of um, well by then maybe they don't use the word feminism, but, uh, the idea was. Um, other than that, uh, it's basically a women's magazine, so it's not only talk about some uh, some ideas, but it's also talk about like the daily stuff. Uh, it's basically like women magazine, but but yeah, uh, Sugiyarti's um writings also contains a topic of women, children, and feminism, although not packaged as feminism per se. Add uh, something to it. Um, yeah, maybe if we can be back to the poem, um, like um, kebebasan or wanita 
Yeah, I, I think if we can see this, um, like the, I think it's quite, quite to see like how, how they, um, it, at that time, 60s, they, um, she tried to like really refuse what the role of woman in Indonesia at the time, like it, this it's, you see, we are no longer that so blah, 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 but we are like human, like really to, to um, equal, to be equal. So yeah, I think it's already speak about, it's really obvious, yeah, I think. Again. <laughs> So in 1959, the year where uh, when Sugiyati was appointed as a member of the uh, Central Lekra Committee, uh, she also uh, had a speech in the first Lekra Congress. And uh, I think if I'm not mistaken, uh, her speech especially doesn't have anything to do uh, with uh, women. My take is that um, somehow, although still the the, the uh, they are fewer uh, less women than the men somehow like uh they put the woman there because they have like the same task or like same responsibility as the men so uh, at least that's my take i mean uh her feminism is expressed in her works instead thank you, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for this wonderful event. I have a question around archives that maybe you might answer, but probably all of you, um, because for films, for example, I know there is a big film archive in Jakarta, but is there something similar around literature that might also have all of these poems and, and where is that and what's the name if, if there is any? Uh, yes, I maybe i only know a few but in jakarta uh, there is a special archive for literature it's called hb pusat dokumentasi sastra hb yasin so uh, the center of literary documentation of hb yasin which comes from the personal archive of a literary critic and it's in in the city center taman ismail marzuki if you know where it is um, and then there is the National Library. Um, uh, and then there is uh, the Library of um, Literary and Cultural Studies of University of Indonesia. I think, I mean, these are only the few that I know. I, I'm sure there are many more. Yeah, uh, in Yogyakarta, uh, we also have uh, like the archive, archi archival center, which contains like a lot of issues throughout the history, but I think like especially in Yogyakarta itself. But something uh, interesting that emerged, I think in the, in the past two years or so, there is this one guy who opened like a business they called uh, Warung Arsip. If we translate, it became, uh, do you know about this? No, it's like a archive shop. So this basically like a, a history junkie. Is, is that how you say it? You know, like history nerd, uh, history junkie who who really archive like everything and everything that happened throughout the history, and he actually sell them in a like a, a bundle, which uh which was quite uh accessible. Uh, uh, if I'm not mistaken, I think I, I can show it like real quick, but uh, I can just tell you, uh, he also like uh, sold like old exemplar of like this old magazine that I told you about like Apekatene. Obviously, we uh, cannot reach him from here. I mean, uh, to, to, to have them shipped. But yeah, uh, it's a thing. Uh, it's interesting because this is not strictly academic uh, business. It's like really popular business. I mean, so yeah, it's. Okay. Oh. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs>
or maybe should we ask like uh, if people online uh, if they whether they have question or not or want to say something they can hear me right <laughs> For the people who join online, if you have any questions, please leave in the chat box or you can also turn on the audio and speak directly. I have a question. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so based on this research, do you have any plan to develop further your research or you want to transform, in, transform it into another set of piece or Whatever it is, <laughs> have any, any plan? <laughs> uh, well, firstly, I want to say that this session is actually also a follow-up from something that's happened before, which is the Arya T theater piece. Uh, so uh, it's a start and it's, a, it's an exciting start because like from here, like there are a lot of possibilities, but uh, maybe if, I, uh, if I'm allowed to link to, the rest of you guys, I think like we're going to do it, <laughs> right? I mean, uh, hopefully, uh, because you invited us to create something together that's uh, more performative. So, and Umi and I already talked and um, this could be like a great starting point. Like Sugiyati herself has a lot of stories. And for me personally, I like that the name Sugiyati rhymes with Ariati. So it kind of like, uh, yeah, it's nice if like, we have like a lot of something e something like azari umi ariati sugiyarti like muni <laughs> i'm just kidding but yeah but um this this definitely a start uh yeah in the last couple of weeks we don't have the capacity to think further about it uh but yeah well, what do you say <laughs> of course we if we get funding <laughs> So yeah. Um, yeah, I have a question regarding the title Juanita, uh, because in my understanding, Juanita refers more to a woman which is more traditional and doing what her husband tells her, and perempuan would the word more for a more independent woman, and whether maybe at that time that was different or yeah. I'm going to give it this to you because like you probably going to talk about this uh, longer but uh, for me personally I it's difficult for me to answer that question because back then uh, the, the language the people the way people use the language is really really different uh, like the uh, the word that they pick so uh, yeah it, it, um, I wouldn't dare to 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 try my my uh, to try and use my understand understanding to to the word wanita and perempuan now to figure out what happened then. But yeah, I think um, I would agree if you say like she used the word wanita because it's more mature, it's more graceful than the word perempuan. You know, not to take anything uh, from the word perempuan itself. But yeah, wanita, like man. <laughs> um, I need to do more research to answer this question, but I think it in this context, in no context nowadays in Indonesia, Bahasa Indonesia we use wanita for like you know wanita career is like woman who really have a career wanita career. So wanita is more like independent these days. I don't know back time, but. No, yeah, but perempuan is more traditional. I mean, in in context this day in Bahasa Indonesia, we use that word so, but I don't know at the time, maybe uh, so similar. Yeah. 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 Maybe we can also consider uh, that Indonesian language is like, um, it's very young. It's basically developed as a, a real language with gram grammar, standardized grammars and stuff in like 20th century. And before that, uh, it was adapted by uh, the core of it is like trade language from Malay and um, 
it was coined together with different languages, Sanskrit, um, Dutch, English, French. So, you know, the, this whole combination is what we know now as the Indonesian language. And um, if I would remember how uh, feminist organizations were called uh, in, in the 20th century, they use different words like uh, istri, yeah, for, for, for women, istri, uh, which for, from our today's perspective would mean wife, but not only. Uh, like in Javanese language, it also means woman, right, female. Um, wanita uh, also comes from like Javanese, whereas perempuan comes more, more from Malay uh, roots. So um, I, I think uh, by looking at certain words, we can trace like gen the genealogy um, of uh, geopolitics where this um, feminism comes from. Maybe I can simplify it like that like for example if she uses this word we could almost expect that it comes from uh, the cultural context of java which is now like maybe the most dominant um culture cultural perspective in the indonesian nation if she was coming from uh, other islands probably she would call her poem differently um so uh, especially before 1965, I think the use of Juanita and Perempuan cannot be compared in the same way as how it was used during the military regime, which is like post-65, what um, Azari and Umi explained, you know, this major change that happened in, in uh, mid-1965, which really brought um, a big um uh, obstacle to women's movements and um domesticize women and uh so i guess you know if we look at the word wanita during the military regime i agree with you that it signals like more pacification uh whereas if we look at uh the use of the same word before 1965 it means very differently like one of the biggest uh, and, and the most progressive women's movement where Sugiyarti Siswadi was working was Gerwani. That's like the Indonesian women's movement. Um, yeah, so I think we, we let's not forget to relativize that. Just a short question. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I know you're doing this um, platform called uh, School of Women's Thought based in Indonesia. Maybe you can introduce a bit more about it. Uh, oh, yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. It's uh, I so together with six other friends who work in different uh, disciplines of arts and culture. Um, some of us are writers like myself. I'm a film archivist. Um, some of us are involved in visual arts and theater. So uh, in 2018, like um, around the time where this uh, collective was also formed, um, we um, uh, got together as a team to uh, manage at that time um, uh, a grant for you know women who wanted to do art projects. Uh, it can be for artwork. It can be for research. And from that initiative, um, we managed to support like different uh, projects, as as many as forty different projects. And this book uh, is actually one of it. Um, and after 2019, the money basically ran out, <laughs> it's finished. Uh, so, but from this experience of, of working with 40 different projects, uh, I guess we, we see how complex and how much alive uh, the scene of, of feminist uh, production of knowledge is in Indonesia. And, what is crazy about that experience was that it 
the, it didn't only happen in certain parts of Indonesia. Indonesia consists of 17,000 islands. Um, so it, it was simultaneously happening in so many different islands in Indonesia and they talk to each other. Um, and it also is not only talking among the islands of Indonesia, but with the diaspora, like, you know, Umi and Azari. So um, maybe uh, to, to answer your question shortly, um, the follow up to that project in 2019 is now um, taking up a different form. It's more low budget. Uh, every year we uh, create a virtual festival every end of July for three weeks in, in one weekend where uh, we invite feminists to present their projects. Um, it can be something like biographical research, if you, are, if you do something about theater, music, um, uh, and under only one condition that the exchange will happen in Indonesian language. Um, this is also to address uh, the absence or the lack, maybe not absence, the lack of, of feminist production of knowledge in this language. Um, I mean, a lot of feminist, Indonesian feminists would have to produce their work in English or French or be, because they were studying abroad. Um, or they were writing during the colonial period, like Kartini. Um, so to, to counter that, we encourage that the exchange happens in this language. So uh, I hope, Muni, that answers your question. <laughs> Thank you so much for the opportunity. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> this is the website that we started out in 2021 uh, so two years after this grant uh, series of grant project was finished and it was the second year of the pandemic if you all remember uh, where we mm, we met for the second time virtually, um, actually, first of all, because of the pandemic, but uh, later we found, hey, this is actually not so bad, you know, <laughs> this is like a low budget strategy to meet from, you know, with people from different islands uh, and also with the diaspora and to, let's say, do our annual harvest together of, you know, <laughs> what has been produced um, in different places. So if you're interested to yeah, know more, please come and visit. Um, and maybe we, you know, we change more in, in the future. Um, starting from 2021, uh, maybe this is important, there is uh, one special panel, however, that happens in English with the Indonesian translation. And this is a special panel for um, transnational feminist solidarity. So maybe we will meet there one of these years. <laughs> Any other questions? People who join online? Yeah, I guess then that's it. <laughs> yeah, if you want to follow up our program from our stand, uh, this reading session happening like almost every every month, but December, November, yeah, we are scheduled for another reading group, <laughs> which hasn't really confirmed yet. So we will announce shortly on in our Instagram account. And December, we don't have a reading group because December is a quiet month for <laughs> celebrating the end of the year. 
And from January, we start again our reading session online. It will happen online uh, at only at January, but from February, it will happen again in AP, AP Bookstore here. Uh, apart from that, we are scheduled, we have another uh, upcoming event, uh, which is next week. Uh, it will happen in Kalis, which is the backyard of, of this building. If you go further uh, into this building, there is a big um, organization called Kalis, and they're hosting the, the screening of um, uh, artists changing Kaizen the one I shortly introduced uh, in the moderation of this talk. And that's scheduled for 20th of October next week and 6.30 p.m. And Changing Kaizen will be at present in, in Kalis and there will be a Q&A section. So if you want to see her film, it's gonna be around like more than one hour, one and 10 minutes, like 70 something minute. Uh, quite long film and after that uh, there will be a like short q a section so if you want to join please come to Kalis. yeah thank you thank you for joining today's section